Welcome to the Cambridge Public Library. It is so great to see you all here. How many of you have been here before? Any of you fans? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Are you guys excited? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> My name is Julie Roach. For those of you who don't know me, I manage youth services here at the Cambridge Public Library. And like all of you, I am a huge fan of Oliver Jeffers, so I am so excited about tonight. I just want to take a second to recognize the youth services librarians and staff that put a lot in tonight, into making tonight happen, and also to our communications manager, Zoe Delmar. They're going to wave from the doorway just now. Maybe not. They're still outside making it happen. And I want to take... Um, one more moment to uh, recognize our leader and director, Dr. Maria McCauley. Maria, will you wave to us? Thank you so much for being here tonight. We are so lucky at the Cambridge Public Library to have a really wonderful and special partnership with the Porter Square Books here in Cambridge. Uh, there are so many of the authors that you see here at the library we are able to bring to you because of our partnership with Porter Square Books. Uh, so it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce you to David Sandberg. David is the owner of Porter Square Books. He's the, secre he's the secretary of the Cambridge Public Library Foundation, and he's also the co-founder of the Porter Square Books Foundation, which um, promotes literacy in local schools. An astonishing number of children in Cambridge uh, get to meet authors that they love and get to take home a free book of their very own signed by that author because of the work that this foundation does. It's truly incredible, this work. Please join me in welcoming David Sandberg. Thanks, Julie. Um, Thank you so much. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. I just wanted to say um, a quick word in addition to what Julie said about the wonderful partnership we have between the bookstore and the library. Um, sometimes people in the store, if, I, if they find out a book is too expensive or we don't have it in stock, they say, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I'll just get it from the library. And I always say, you never have to apologize to me because you're getting the book from the library. You can apologize if you're getting it from that website that begins with A, but you don't, you should never apologize for getting a book from the library. Um, we love the library and we love working with the library. One thing that we do um, at this time of year with the library is we have a drive uh, to, um, to get, um, when you're thinking about gift giving at, at this time of year, we do a drive together with the library to get books into the hands of children in transitional housing in Cambridge. And what we do as, as the bookstore is any book that you buy that's going to get donated to that drive will discount by 20%. And we've had dozens and dozens of books that have been purchased already, and we still have a few more weeks to go. So I hope you'll do that. And then Julie also mentioned the foundation. We are very proud of the work that the Port Square Books Foundation does. And if you want to know more about that, feel free to talk to any one of us um, from the bookstore. Um, so Oliver Jeffers is one of those people that when you say, we have Oliver Jeffers coming, they say, whoa, Oliver Jeffers. And he really is, in the world, in the world of children's literature and illustration, he is a whoa kind of guy. Um, I'm sure each of you has your favorite Oliver book. I have mine. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, but, um, but if I listed all the awards that he's won for his writing and illustration, then you wouldn't even get time to hear him because that list would go on and on and on. Um, so I'll just tell you a couple of things about him that you may not know. One is, if you heard him speak, you'll know right away that he grew up in Ireland, but what you may not know is he was actually born in Australia. Um, also, you might think of him in the context of kids' books, but he's actually, um, his first field is fine art, and he's a very accomplished artist, and his work has been exhibited at galleries all over the world. Um, uh, so, you know, in, in the book world, we talk about kids' books and adult books. I think in the art world, if you talk about adult art, it probably means something different. So, he, but, but, but he does do adult um, art. Um, as a teenager, this is a little known fact, he liked to play the spoons. But he apparently had no musical talent whatsoever, so he became an artist instead, and he's done that very well. And, and, and this is the last thing I'll say. Um, he likes plastic food. Now, I read that on the internet, and he can explain what exactly that means. Oh, the, the, the website. Oh, plastic food. Ah, I see. Fruit. Fruit. Yes. I don't know where you're getting this from. 
<laughs> the internet. Um, he believes that most four-year-olds share his sense of humor, so please join me in getting a chance to listen to that sense of humor. Please welcome Oliver Jeffers. Hello, I'll stand over here because there's a microphone so I can be louder and you have to listen to me. Can you, can you all see me? Okay. Um, and then if I, if I do this, can you see that my name is Oliver Jeffers? Okay. That is my name. And, and I know this because that's what it says on my driver's license. <clears throat> and I am an adult human being and uh, this is where I am standing. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> uh, I have been um, telling stories and making books for over 15 years, which is kind of a long time when you think about it. Is there anybody here who's 15 years old or younger? Well, that, that means that I've been making books for longer than you have been alive, which feels like a long time to me. Um, I did just celebrate the fourth anniversary of my 36th birthday, um, so... <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, but it, here's something that not a lot of people know. People do ask me, uh, where, where do you get your ideas for your, your stories from? And, and I'll show you a little bit later on, but mostly, actually, all of them are completely true stories. They're all completely true stories. So one of my books has this guy. Now I'm going to, by the wonders of technology, I figured this would be better than a, than a flip chart. So I'm going to draw for you now. Um, so in... One of my books, I have got this guy, which you may think, why are you drawing a potato? But this is actually a penguin. A penguins are only made up of three parts, which is its head, its body, and its useless wings, because it can't fly. Um, but I have, a, I have a book, and in, in this book, there is a penguin, and it's called Lost and Found. And in this book, there is a boy who finds a penguin and brings it back via rowboat to the South Pole. And this is a true story. It's a completely true story. Okay, it's mostly true. There's, I'm, I made up some bits. Uh, has anybody read Lost and Found? Well, they will know. Do you know the bit where he, he, uh, uh, the penguin gets into the umbrella and goes back? The umbrella in real life was actually blue, not orange. <laughs> so I made that bit up. Um, oh yeah, and I also made up the whole bit about the rowboat and the boy and the, bringing him to the South Pole. All those bits are made up. Here's what really happened. I come from a place called Belfast, as, as David explained, and, and he's wrong though, it's not why I talk the way that I talk, it's actually why you all talk the way that you talk. <laughs> because did you know that Belfast is the only place on planet Earth where we do not have an accent? <laughs> that is it. So everybody else has an accent, but apart from people from Belfast. Um, but in Belfast there is a zoo, and they call it Belfast Zoo. And in Belfast Zoo there is a penguin enclosure, and in the penguin enclosure, I'm sure you can guess, there are penguins. And one day, oh, it must be nearly two decades ago, uh, a school group went to Belfast Zoo, and one of the kids managed to break away from the group, climb into the penguin enclosure, and managed to actually climb out of the penguin enclosure again. This really happened with a baby penguin under his coat. And he managed to get the entire way home before anybody noticed. This actually happened. And by that stage, the zoo had closed for the day, so they had to keep the penguin in the bathtub overnight until the man from the zoo could come the next morning to get it. And I always wondered to myself, what did they talk about all night? This boy and his penguin. And that's, that's where I came up with the idea for, uh, for Lost and Found. So, okay, I'll give you another one. Uh, so this, there's, there's a, see if you can guess what that is. It is not a cloud. This is a tree, and if you know where this tree is, and you were to drive past, you might find in it a kite, and you might also find a ladder, and you might also find a blue whale, and you might also find a really enormous ship. Although that might be the first thing you notice, not the tree. And at the bottom of this tree, you may find 
small boy called Floyd, who is looking up at this tree and wondering what happened. Uh, this is a, this is a, a story, this is a book of mine called Stuck. And Stuck is also a completely true story. <clears throat> Except it didn't happen, this didn't happen to Floyd. This happened to me. This happened to yours truly. Uh, I went with some friends on a vacation. We rented a house to try and get away for a little while and, and uh, away from the craziness of my studio. Uh, and we got to this house and inside the closet door as you come in, there was this really lovely looking kite. And it also looked like a really expensive kite, but we thought we would take it out for a fly right away. And pure Charlie Brown style, within 15 seconds, we managed to get it lodged in the top of a tall tree. Uh, and then I tried, I thought to myself, well, that's a pretty expensive looking kite. Um, I think that I will probably ruin the rest of my trip by trying to get this kite back out of this tree. Uh, and I did, and I tried to climb up, and I, it was too tall. And then I, uh, I took off my shoe, and I tried to hit it with my shoe. And the third time, I missed the first two times. Third time, I hit it, and then the fourth time, my shoe got stuck. And then my other shoe got stuck, and then a ball got stuck. Uh, and then, okay, so I didn't really throw a duck up in the air. We couldn't find a duck, so I made that bit up. But we did give up after, um, after we uh, almost smashed the windscreen of the rental car with a chair. And I decided to just, just let's, let's leave the kite in the tree. And that was it. It's still stuck there for all I know this day, and we left. And I actually left in kind of a bad mood because... The reason that we'd gone on this vacation was for me to get away from my studio and try and go away and come up with a book idea. And all I did was try to get the stupid kite out of the stupid tree. And it wasn't until I got back to my studio and somebody said, well, how was your vacation? And I told them what happened. I realized, actually, wait a minute, maybe I did have a book idea after all. So that's sort of a true story, but kind of, well, mostly made up. Um, all right, let me tell you about another one. So this story I didn't write, but I just drew the pictures for. And how this story came about is um, my friend Drew came home from work one day and he found a pile of letters with his name on them. And they were all written to him by his crayons who were complaining about being misused. So wait a minute, that one actually is a totally true story. That's completely true. Uh, and I'm sure you can tell just by looking at this crayon, this is a black and white drawing of a green crayon. <laughs> I'm sure you knew that though, right? You can tell that's green. Can you? Yeah? Right, we'll try another one. See if you can guess what color crayon this one is. You're right, this is a blue crayon. I'm not even finished drawing it yet. Excellent. Uh, okay, we'll try another one. Uh, this one is... This one is... You're right, this is the beige crayon, because he's sad. Beige is sad because all he gets to do is color weight. All right, we'll try one last one, just to see if you can get four for four. What color crayon is this one? It is white, and I've barely even started. <laughs> Obviously, this is because of my superior drawing skills, but you can tell this is a black and white drawing of a white crayon with only two or three strokes of paper. And, and you know, that's, that's something. That's pretty, that's pretty something. Is anybody here really good at drawing? Couple people. Couple people. Is there anybody here, be honest, who's not really good at drawing? Is there anybody here who's kind of terrible at drawing? Yeah? You know, I used to be terrible at drawing too. Um, well, I, I started off with a lot of promise, but then I didn't really progress very, very far. So when I was like 16, here's how I was drawing people. That's not very good, is it? And the reason that this is so bad is it's before I went to art college. <laughs> and then, then I went to art college and I got a four-year university education in how to draw and art history and art shadows and function and form and perspective. And this is the way I draw today. <laughs> Which is so much better, isn't it? Don't you wish you could draw that well? Yeah. I, I, love, I love drawing people and making them look like they feel a certain way. So if you had to guess how this person felt. Give him some ears. How do you think this person feels? Happy. Yeah, happy. Okay, we'll try one more. 
Um, everybody's always they make this a girl this time. So, how do you think this person feels? I was hoping you would say melancholy, but I'll settle for sad. Um, but I think I've become so good at drawing people that it's actually difficult to tell which one is the person and which one is the drawing. Do, do you believe me? Do you believe I can do this? Yes? Yes? Do you want to see me try? Okay. I am going to need a volunteer, though. I'm going to need a volunteer for whom I can, whose portrait I can paint. Anybody? No volunteers? Okay. Yes, you, my friend, who's already running halfway downstairs. Just, just one of you, just one of you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Come on, come on. Yes. What's your name? Hudo. Your name's what? Hudo. Hudo. Okay, Hudo. Can you, can you come stand here, please? Udo. Udo. Okay. Now, I need for you to stand really, really still. Can you put, take your hood down, please? So I guess I need to see it, right? Okay. Now, let's see how still you can stand. One, two, three, go. That's pretty good. Wait, did you move? <laughs> oh, he's good, he's good, okay, all right, okay, don't move. Wait, did you move? You're further away. Did he move? Okay. Measure him up. Test the wind. Stretch. All right, here we go. Well, off to a good start. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I think that's a terrific job, don't you? Okay. You can use this, you know, for your driving license photograph if you like. Get in touch with me. Yeah, thank you very much. You can take a bow. Thank you. See? Very superior. Um, okay, so I, I like... I like drawing pictures, but I also love telling stories. Um, and I've always uh, been really, really good at telling stories. And I think partly this comes from growing up in Belfast, where everybody is a storyteller, whether you want them to be or not. And uh, this, uh, everybody, from, from kids in the playground, uncles in the pub, the grannies in the kitchen, everybody's a storyteller, and you can't get anybody to shut up ever. Um, and over the years, you learn that there's a real art to storytelling. Mostly, it's timing, <laughs> but it's also structure. So you have a, a good, a three, all stories of three things, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And anybody here write stories? Anybody here want to write stories when they grow up? A couple of people? Do, do you ever get when you're writing a story and you start off with, it starts off really well, comes out of the blocks blazing, then you kind of run into problems and you don't really know what to do, and you're a bit stuck, and then you get writer's block. Does this ever happen? Yeah? Well, you're in luck, my friends, because I have the solution for you. This is all you need to do. If you're telling a story and it's not working so well, the only thing you need to do is take your story and put in an elephant. <laughs> That's all you need to do. And that usually fix things right up. And if you're telling me that that doesn't work for you, and you try that and it doesn't work, there's another thing you can do. Say your story is really bad shape and it needs something like an extra special fix. You take your elephant and you make it a flying elephant. <laughs> and that should work. But if for whatever reason that doesn't actually fix your story, there's another thing you can do. You make it a flying elephant with laser vision. <laughs> and that should fix your item. But if for whatever reason that still doesn't help fix your story, you got one last trick up your sleeve, and that is that you make it a flying elephant with laser vision that's on fire. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, you should not be writing stories. So, 
I like drawing and I like telling stories and what I've loved to do over the years is to tell stories and draw at the same time. So I like to draw stories. Do you want to see me do this? Okay, now this is another true story and it's about a friend of mine called Henry. And Henry, what made Henry remarkable is that Henry loved books. And you might be thinking to yourself, what is so remarkable about that? I love books. Here I am in a public library on a Thursday night. I like books too. But what made Henry unusual is that while you and I like to read books, Henry actually liked to eat books. That's right, he liked to eat them. And it all started quite by mistake one afternoon when he wasn't really paying attention. First, he ate a single word, just to test. Yes, he definitely liked them. Then he finished the rest of the sentence. By the end of the day, he had finished the rest of the chapter. By the end of the week, Henry had eaten the whole book. And by the end of that month, Henry could eat a whole book in one go. And he became known as the incredible book-eating boy. And he became famous all throughout the land. And he would put on a tuxedo and he would take a show on the road and show people his book-eating skills. But that wasn't even the best part. The best part was that the more books Henry was eating, and in order to show you what's going on here, I need to draw a diagram, an anatomical diagram. So the more books Henry was eating, there's a book, and it would go into his mouth. So this is a cross-section anatomical diagram of Henry. So this is what's going on inside. So there's his throat. That leads down into his stomach. So the book would go in his mouth, and all the pages would go down into his stomach and fill him up the way that, I don't know, a hot dog would fill us up. Uh, but all of the information, and this is the best part, would go up into his brain. So Henry was actually getting smarter. So there's his brain. And then he'd eat a book about, I don't know, helicopters, and he would know everything there was to know about helicopters, and his brain would get a little bit bigger. <coughs> Excuse me. And he loved getting smart. And he thought that if he kept going, he might even become the smartest person in the world. So he kept eating books, all sorts of books. He wasn't fussy. He wanted to know it all. It wasn't very long before he was even smarter than his teacher in school. Anybody here smarter than a teacher in school? Okay, oh, one person is smarter than a teacher in school. Um, and so he was able to just recite very, very complicated mathematical equations just off the top of his head. And he decided that he wanted to become the smartest person on earth. And so he went from eating books whole to eating them three and four at a time. Books about anything. And he kept getting smarter and smarter and smarter and greedier and greedier and greedier until, of course, as always happens in these stories, it all started going terribly, terribly wrong. Because out of the blue, a flying elephant with laser vision came along, and that was the end of the story. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. See, it really works. It really works. It works every time. Just remember that. So I have been telling, um, I've been making books, and uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this, this book is not true either. I, I made most of this up. My younger brother did eat a book once, but believe me, he got no smarter. <laughs> so this is made up too. All my books are made up. Yes, I, I lie, professionally, to children. This is, this is what I do. All my books are, are, are completely made up. and. That changed, though, recently, and let me go back here. That changed recently because um, a couple years ago, and because I write books for children as well, actually, let me tell you another thing that people didn't know. I have not been making books for children for 15 years. I've been making books that have just been mostly enjoyed by children. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that, yes, most four and five-year-olds share my sense of humor. Um, do you want to hear my pizza joke? Nah, it's too cheesy. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I heard a really great joke last night. Okay, it's a knock-knock joke. Do you want to go there with me? Knock-knock. Yeah. Europe. Europe. No, Europe! <laughs> See? So, and the reason my jokes have become so terrible as well is because two years ago, 
two years ago, my wife and I, we had a baby. A baby who sounded mostly like that. Uh, does, does anybody here have children? Okay. Uh, is anybody here a child? Everybody here is a child? Is there anybody here who at one point or another is or was a child? Okay, then you probably sounded like that too at some point. Although to be fair, my son wasn't, he wasn't always crying. I know, I know. And uh, because I make books that are mostly enjoyed by children, uh, lots of people ask me when I became a dad, would it change the way that I would make books? And, and the answer is yes that it would change the way that I would make books. Now, I know what all you, you children out there are thinking. You're, you're thinking to yourselves, ew, babies are disgusting. <laughs> or, ew, girls are disgusting. Or, ew, boys are disgusting. I'm never doing that. And you can ask your parents what that is in like 10 years. But despite what you may think now, having children happens to the best of us. And uh, our son was born in New York City two and a half years ago. and. Um, as we brought him home from the hospital, something occurred to me. So I, I started giving him a tour of our one bedroom apartment and we, we got to the front door and, and I said, well, son, here we are. This is where you live. This is your front door. And you know what? You know what? He didn't know what a front door was. <laughs> and then we continued our tour and we went into the living room and I was like, well, son, this is the living room. This is where we keep our chairs. And you know what? He didn't know what a chair was. He didn't know what a chair was for. Uh, and then we continued the tour into the kitchen and he didn't even know what ketchup was. <laughs> was. Like, right, okay. At that point, I realized something. At that point, I realized, of course, children don't know anything. <laughs> right? Right? Is, is anybody here is a child who knows a thing or two? I know everything. Okay, okay, you, you, may, you may know everything. But did you know everything when you were born? Yeah, well, my son certainly didn't know anything when he, when he just showed up. Apart from how to make a lot of noise and how to sometimes do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he didn't know anything. He didn't know, he didn't know about gravity. Uh, he didn't know anything about being here. And here was this, he was just a wee tiny fragile ball of just some atoms and all the hope that me and his mother replaced and I knew nothing about being here and I thought I'm gonna have to teach him everything and while it started as a comedy me giving him a tour and speaking to him when he clearly couldn't understand a word I was saying it is kind of refreshing explaining things to a zero-year-old um, and um, I realized that I was gonna have to be his tour guide for for everything um, and then I remembered that my dad was actually a really good tour guide um, for me and my brothers and he still is a very good tour guide um, he uh, he's, he's always very very good at explaining complicated things uh, in a very simple way but mostly it's because he's really good at pointing at things <laughs> so he's, he's an excellent tour guide and I thought okay if my dad can do this then maybe I can do this as well um, so I thought I'm going to be my son's tour guide and we started off very very simple Okay, who knows what this is? Earth. This is Earth. Now, who knows where on here we are? Let me see if I can... Uh, what, can you see that? Okay, are we here? No. Are we here? No. Are we there? No. There? No. Are we there? No. Are we there? <laughs> there? Are we there? Are we there? Are we there? We there? Okay, we're somewhere around there. <laughs> Great. Okay. And uh, who knows which one of these is Earth? I'll give you a clue. <laughs> and what about the sun? Does anybody know which one's the sun? I'll give you a clue. And did anybody think they could name all the rest of the planets? In alphabetical order in 10 seconds? Okay, I'll give you a clue. Uh, except that's not in alphabetical order. Um, but of all of these planets, where do people live? How many of them have people living on them? One. One. Which one? Earth? I don't think there's anybody living on Mars. And it is Earth. And do you know why this is? Well, air and water, that's one of the reasons. Mostly, it's because this is where all of the Wi-Fi is. 
No, this is not, this is not to scale. This is not a two-scale model of our universe. Yeah, the planets aren't actually all that, that close together. Um, does anybody know how big our solar system really is? It's, it's really big. That's the only official answer I would have accepted. Um, but I saw a really cool thing this summer where uh, the sun was blocked by the moon. It was a total eclipse of the sun. Did anybody see this? Did anybody go to the path of totality where it was 100% eclipse? You guys did? It was really cool. Now, anybody who was not in the path of totality was told that you have to wear glasses, and you had to as well in, in, when you were in totality. So we put on our protective glasses, and we all went to see the total eclipse of the sun. But what we didn't quite realize is just the second before the sun is totally eclipsed, you can take your glasses off because the light gets so low. And we even took a video. <laughs> and... You can see this. It becomes like a giant light switch. So we go up and we look and you can see the sun in the last little bits before it gets completely eclipsed. But what we didn't know is that you can only see the moon whenever it becomes 100% eclipsed. That's the only time you can actually see the moon. Because it completely blocks out the light from all the sun. And it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. Like it was the middle of the afternoon and then all of a sudden it's like somebody flicks a switch and you can see stars. And if you had to say which is bigger between the sun and the moon, which one would you say? Sun. The sun is bigger. But then how come the moon completely covered it? Why do you think that is? Because it's, it's closer. It's small. The moon is smaller. But the sun is further away. Does everybody know the difference between small and far away? Yeah. Well, just in case you don't, we'll, we'll play a video, a little tutorial. Okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> you get it? Is everybody understanding this? Small, far away. Right, okay, so we understand the difference between small and far away. I'm going to do a two-scale model of the universe. So, if the sun was the size of a dinner plate, then the Earth would be the size of a pea, okay? And then the moon would be the size of a poppy seed. And imagine how far away the dinner plate would have to be so that it appeared the same size as the poppy seed. It would have to be about a quarter of a mile away, which is pretty far. And then... Do you know how far, how much distance you would need to show the entire solar system, including Pluto? You would need 16 miles, which is really far. We're 16 miles from here. Who, who knows where, what's about 16 miles from right here? Okay, I don't know, the airport or something? Uh, but just imagine how long it would take you to get there to, to visit Pluto, depending on traffic. Um, but So the point is that space is really, really, really big. And whenever you have a tiny, tiny, tiny baby, it makes you think about this. Really big. Um, and so I started trying to teach my son what I thought were simple things and realized that I actually don't know very much at all. Um, so we, we try to keep it very simple then. And I explained to him that he is a person. And he is one person among many, many people on Earth. Um, and there are more showing up every day. Do you know that there are more people alive today than have ever been alive at any one time before? Yeah. Isn't that pretty incredible? It means that as a species, we're doing very, very well, but it also means we've got to be taking really good care of ourselves and everything else. But so, there are, does anybody know how many people are living on Earth? Uh, 2,000. There's more than 2,000. <laughs> there are 7 billion people living on Earth, and all of those 7 billion people are made up of exactly the same stuff. What is this stuff? There's, let's see, we all have eyeballs. Uh, we all have a mouth with teeth. Uh, what else do we have? We have, we, we have ears. We have noses. What else have we got? Feet, yeah, we got feet. We'll put some feet over there. It's an excellent drawing of a foot, I think you'll find. A belly button there. Uh, I can't, squeeze? A heart? Spleens, okay, yes, there's a spleen. Uh, we got bones. Uh, what else have we got? There's, there's another bones. We got butts. Uh, we got, we got brains. We got lungs. And we got hands. 
Yeah, we got a few drops of blood right there. <laughs> we have, what else have we got? We got, how, how do we chew our food? Meal. Or how do we digest our food? We have meat, stomachs. We got stomachs, so there's a stomach. We'll put a slice of pizza in just so you know. There's a slice of pizza and then the lower intestines. And then, uh, we got feet, we got a neck, there's a neck. Uh, skin, let's draw a perfectly square patch of skin right there. Okay, so basically, everybody's made up of this stuff. Does this look like anybody you know? Well, not technically not all of us have hair. I think that's very unkind of you. But we'll draw on some hair. It's a fabulous haircut I think you'll find. And hats. We'll, we'll give everybody a hat. Okay, with a flower in it. Um, and I think you'll find that this, this is uh, everybody. Everybody here looks like this, sort of. Um, and because there's seven billion of us, and there's more people than there's ever been before, but there's no more space, everybody's kind of walking around and getting in each other's way, and sometimes people are really happy, and sometimes people are sad, and sometimes people are just really grumpy. And what I have realized is, when thinking about it, is that no matter who the person is, all anybody wants in the world, no matter how, no matter how bad-tempered or mean or happy or sad, all anybody wants, what do you think that is? Money. Not money. <laughs> Not Wi-Fi. <laughs> is just to be loved. Oh, just a little bit. That's all anybody really, really wants, deep down. And so that means the most important thing in my opinion, and this is the way that my dad and my mum brought me up, is the most important thing is to be kind. As the 14th Dalai Lama said, be kind whenever it is possible, it is always possible. So do you want to hear the book that I made for my son? Yeah. I'm glad you said that. So we will go here. Here we are. That's it. And Oh, that's the last page. Sorry about that. So here we are. Notes for living on planet Earth by me. And that's, uh, that's how you find your way uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, that's our solar system. But as I've said, it's probably not to scale. Uh, so we'll start here. Well, hello. Welcome to this planet. We call it Earth. It is the big globe floating in space on which we live. We're glad you found us. The space is very big. Uh, I think it's 238,855 miles to the moon. And then Mars, the next planet, is another 140 million miles that way. <laughs> so, the planet is basically made up of two parts. Firstly, there is the land, which is rock and dirt, and then there is the sea, which is water. Firstly, let's talk about the land, because it's what we are standing on or sitting on right now. We know lots about the land. We know that some bits are hot, some bits are pointy or cold, some bits are bumpy or flat. We've got some dry bits and some wet bits. We know a lot about the land. And then there is the sea, which is full of wonderful things. We know a little bit about the sea, like for the fact that it goes nearly seven miles deep, we think, because we're not sure if we find the deepest part yet. But as I explained to my son, we will talk about this some more once he's learned to swim. Can everybody here swim? Is there anybody here who can't swim? A few people. Okay, anybody who's got their hand up that can't swim, promise me that you're going to take lessons and learn how to swim, because it will come in handy one day. There is also the sky, though that can get pretty complicated, so we'll move on. <laughs> on our planet, there are people. One people is a person. You are a person. You have a body, as we have gone over. Look after it, as most bits don't grow back. Apart from bits that grow back are your fingernails and toenails and your hair. The most important things for people to remember are to eat, drink, and stay warm. People come in many shapes, sizes, and colors. We may all look different, act different, and sound different, but don't be fooled, we are all people. There are animals too. They come in even more shapes, sizes, and colors. They can't speak, though that's no reason not to be nice to them. Apart from parrots. Apparently parrots can speak. <laughs> you may not be able to speak yet either, even though your head is filled with questions. Can everybody here speak? Is there anybody out here who can't speak? It's a few people. Some people down here can't speak. So yeah, be patient. You'll learn how to use words soon enough. Generally how it works is when the sun is out, it is daytime, and we do stuff. The rest of the time is night, when it is dark, apart from the moon, and we sleep. Please. 
My son, honestly, used to like going to bed with a hammer. That is not making that up. Things can sometimes move slowly here on earth. More often, though, they move quickly. <clears throat> so use your time well. It will be gone before you know it. Though we've come a long way, we haven't quite worked everything out. So there's plenty left for you to do. You'll figure lots of things out for yourself. Just remember to leave notes for everyone else. It looks big, Earth. But there are lots of us on here. 7,327,450,667 people the last time I counted. So be kind. There is enough for everybody. Well, that is planet Earth. Make sure you look after it as it's all we've got. Now, if you need to know anything else, just ask. I won't be far away. And when I'm not around, you can always ask someone else because you're never alone on Earth. And that is the end of the book. Thank you very much. Actually, let's go back here. So this is, uh, this is, it took me two years to make this book. And this is what my son looks like now. He's now two and a half. Um, and it's actually my first ever completely not made up book. Um, it's non-fiction. So it's kind of a science book. <laughs> Although I'm sure there are plenty of scientists who would, who would disagree with that. Um, but, uh, you know, stories that are made up are pretty important too, I think. Uh, and a lot of people would say that stories are the most important things that people have ever created. Um, which is obviously why I decided I wanted to make up stories when I, when I grew up. Um, but uh, remember at the start I did say where people, people always ask me where I get my ideas from? The, the answer is, I actually get them from Darth Vader. Um, now, is there anybody here who wants to, uh, to draw stories or tell stories whenever they grow up? There, there, there are a few people. Okay, well, I am going to tell you my top tips for, uh, you know, let's, I'll, I'll expand it rather than just from being a storyteller or a story writer um, to just top tips for, for being a human being on planet Earth for how to get ahead. So if you, if you, um, you want to make art or, or tell stories, you never know when you're going to get an idea so it's very very important that you always carry a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper because you never know when an idea is going to strike now in my experience ideas come whenever you're not really thinking about them so that's why I have I found and why most people have their best ideas in the shower so that's why you should always take a shower at least once a month. <laughs> now, um, if you're kind of the lazy sort and you don't ever really want to work again, um, here's all you have to do. Is It's very, very simple. And if you actually don't want your parents to even ever have to work again, all you got to do is write a Christmas hit. A Christmas musical hit. And then... You never need to work again. <laughs> Come up with a good Christmas song and you'll be set for life. Um, actually, this is, this is a, a really good piece of advice that my grandfather gave me um, about succeeding in life in general. Uh, if you, if you want to get in somewhere for free, all you have to do is very confidently walk in backwards and they think you're leaving. It's so simple. Um, and another piece of advice my grandfather gave me, and I've lived by this, I've tried to live by this, which is never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, eat anything larger than your head in one sitting. <laughs> Just don't do it, and you will go far. Uh, okay. I, um, oh, yeah. In my experience, uh, a shark would definitely win in a fight against a bear. Um, but only if the fight takes place at sea. That's the only way that that would work. Um, okay, do you have any more advice to offer you? Oh yes, yes, of course. This is, the, this, is, this is the best piece of advice you can, all you kids out there, take note. My son doesn't know this one yet. Um, and it goes like this. If, say, you've asked your mother something and she says 
No. All you do is you wait for five minutes, <laughs> and then you go and you very quietly ask your dad, <laughs> and you will go far. Um, okay. Do I have? Actually, you know what? I do. I have one one last piece of advice for you. If you can't afford a trombone. All you have to do is buy a motorcycle. <laughs> and that is that. <clears throat> and uh, that is all I have to, to tell you tonight. But I think we got a little bit of time to answer some questions. But uh, so if anybody's got a question, we will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask them now and I will answer them. And we'll maybe turn the lights up a little bit. Uh, but it's OK if I've already been asked the greatest question I've ever been asked, which is, Dear Oliver Jeffers, what is your name? <laughs> so, so don't put any pressure on yourself. Now, does anybody out there have a question? Okay, you, my friend, have a question. Shout it out. How do I make the books? Well, first of all, I think of the idea, and then what I do is I see what it will look like so by drawing some pictures, and then I see what it'll sound like by writing up some words, and then the hardest part of making a book is trying to figure out how to fit all of the story that's got a beginning and a middle and an end into 32 pages, because that's how many pages normally are in picture books, and that can be the hardest part. And it's just a lot of practice and, and uh, doing it over and over again until you think it feels right. And then you send it off to the publisher, and they do all the, the magical parts about getting it printed and putting it into the hands of booksellers and libraries, and then you've got a book. So that's how you make a book in a very concise period of time. Normally that takes about a year. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, yes, you with the sparkly jumper at the back. You wanna shout it out, see if I can hear you? Why do I make the books? Um, because it's a, it's a lot more fun than selling health insurance policies. And no, no offense if anybody here sells health insurance policies. Oh, you do? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm only joking. Um, okay, you've got a question. I, do I have more than one pet or at least one pet? I have one pet. And my pet is a, a dog, we think. And her name is Scampy. Yes, and she was found in the park, and they actually didn't know she was a dog when she was found. She was in such bad condition. But we, we took her in, and now she, she was king of the castle, but once anybody who's got a dog and then has a kid knows what happens is that the dog gets demoted, demoted to actually being the dog. So, so she's, uh, she's, she's pretty sad these days, because she doesn't get as much attention as she used to. But we, we have a, a dog, yeah. Okay, yes, you, my friend, the blue top. Can you, can you say that again and shout it really loudly? Have I thought of using a pink flying elephant? Um, I, yeah, that would be good, but I've only got a, I'm only using a black pen. Well, actually, maybe that was a black and white drawing of a pink flying elephant. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but it is now, obviously. But yes, you have a question. How old was your brother when he uh, 18? <laughs> yeah, and he still didn't get any smarter. Green top up there. He had to look down to check. I like that. Uh, badly, it seems. Um, uh, I, I made a book with Owen Colfer, and whenever I was doing an event with uh, Owen Colfer in Dublin, and that's called Imaginary Fred, and he's an Irish writer, uh, and his son was there, and his son put up his hand in the audience. He said, Dear Mr. Jeffers, um, why are your drawings so popular? <laughs> It took me a, realize the, a second to realize that that was not a compliment. Um, but yeah, I, I draw people quickly uh, and probably quite badly. But it's the speed at which I do them, I think, is, is interesting. And people do ask me all the time if I can actually draw feet, because I seem to never draw feet. And I can, I just am not very good at counting toes. Because I think if you go back, I probably left out a couple of toes. But just practice. And, and if you come to my studio, you can walk in at exactly the wrong time, where I'll say, oh, wait, can you stop? Could, right, can you look like you're doing this? And I'll get people to pose, and then you very quickly draw it. So you draw from real life, 
But then you try and do it very, very quickly. That's, that's the way that I do it anyway. Everybody's got their own ways. Uh, okay, do we have any other questions? Yes, I'm here. Uh, well, I, I wasn't lying when I said that all of the books up until this one have been made with one person as the target audience, and that's me. But that's also me as an adult and me remembering the way that I liked stories when I was a kid. Um, so I just try to satisfy myself. So I'm, I'm aware that adults are reading my books, but I, I don't want to talk down to the, the people who enjoy my books who are uh, five, four, five, six, seven. But I also don't want to just be so smart that it's only for adults it's i'm just there's a duality there but it's mostly if i can satisfy myself and i'm, I'm not speaking down to anybody but also not assuming too much of anybody i think that that keeps everybody happy yes you got a question put your work out there it's it's much easier now than it was uh 20 years ago when i was starting out um because of social media and, and, and everything like that. But um, yeah, put your work out there and be okay with hearing no a lot, because you will hear no a lot. Uh, JK Rowling got rejected by, I think, 12 publishers before Bloomsbury picked up Harry Potter. Um, the day the crayons quit, Drew Daywalt, the author, had been showing that to publishers for six years and constantly getting rejected until my editor saw it and put me together with it. And then once it happened, it just it, it blew up. So if you hear no and you're still fine with that and you're still making your work, that's the you, you'll, you've already won twice. Yes, you another question? Yeah. My favorite book that I've written is probably Here We Are, mostly because it took me two years to make, and I can't quite believe I got it finished and it's already out, and, uh, and I'm talking about it out, out in public. But normally, does, uh, any, any parents here have more than one child? Have you, have you ever been asked who's your favorite child? It's, uh, well, somebody actually asked me at a, at a book signing, um, what is your least favorite of your own books? <laughs> I, was like, oh. I was like, as a parent, have you ever been asked that? Uh, uh, it, it is, it's always the one that I've just finished, I think, because that's the one that my head has mostly been in for so long. So I, I, it's a difficult one to answer. Okay, yeah, you've got a question? <clears throat> my favorite children's books? Um, Picture books, I always loved. Uh, I, you know, I wasn't a big reader when I was a kid. When I was very young, I was much more interested in being outside, and reading felt like something I was being told to do. It felt like homework, until I decided to read for myself, and I discovered I loved it. Um, so the ones that I remember from when I was very small are uh, Eric Carle, The Bad-Tempered Ladybird, or I think it's The Grudgy Ladybug. It's, it was translated into British. Um, and I always loved the, the, the way in which the whale spread, and that seemed so big, because whenever I close the book, the book seemed like the same size as all the other books. And then one day I, it, I realized it's because you could see the ladybug beside it. And it was I discovered perspective and scale, and it felt like this magic trick. Um, and then for reading books, it was uh, Roald Dahl. The BFG was the one that got me into properly reading chapter books. I just loved everything that he did. Um, yeah. All right. Should we wrap this up and I'll sign some people's books then? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.